Hey, I'm Matt, this is the 10 Minute Bible Hour. I'm in Denver, Colorado at the Assumption Greek Orthodox Cathedral. And I don't know if you know this about me or not, but I'm, I guess, the kind of Christian that you call a Protestant, which means that this is not in my wheelhouse. I'm stepping outside my element to learn something new about really what effectively is a big fatty branch of the Christian family tree that's on the other side of the trunk from me. So the guy who runs this joint's been kind enough to let me run in here and meet with him. He's going to show me around and answer my questions and hopefully I'm going to learn some stuff I didn't know before. No, maybe you will too. This place smells different than Protestantism. There's like incense and this is Chris. I'm Matt. Nice to meet you. I work here. Is it weird <laughs> if I wear the hat in here? Is no, that all right? It's, it's empty. If it was full, we would, we would whack it off your head. Okay. <laughs> that's that's <laughs> good. Kidding. I'm glad there are boundaries. Would you mind just showing me around the place and how it works? Most of the Orthodox churches are domed. The ancient churches usually were domed. The first churches um, that were given to the church were uh, actually gymnasiums and that's where the basilica comes from. The dome basically has Christ in the middle, who we, you know, for us is God. So God watches over everything. Everybody can see him. If you're on that side, on this side, you see each other. And uh, the dome has always been uh, the Christian symbol. But you know who stole that, right? The government, all well, the governments have domes now because yeah, they want to yeah. watch over you and collect all your taxes. And <laughs> I automatically like you. So uh, when you come into the, you know, into the church here, the uh, front is um, it's still part of the dome, but usually what we would call an apse. Okay. And in there is uh, an icon of the Virgin Mary presenting the Christ child. So architecturally, there's kind of a message where God is up here, we're down here, and then the incarnation is right in the middle. And then if you look, here, this is the nativity of Christ. There's actually two Christ childs in there. If you look at him, especially the one where he's bathing, I mean, he doesn't look like a child. He looks right. like a little shrunken man. He's right. even got a receiving, receding forehead. I don't and, know anything about that. And a musculature. And the reason is they don't want to portray, you know, Jesus as a baby. They want to portray the, 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 the divinity of Christ, the maturity of Christ, even in a little baby. So the Byzantine iconography usually does stuff like that. So the faces are long. The fingers are long, the colors are more earthen, and there's no, there's no expressions. The real cool thing that the ancient Greeks discovered is you become part of the art because however you feel, with no expression, you paint that on there. So, oh. if, you know, whatever you see, you see, so all of these, you won't see a smile. You'll see Jesus on the cross and there's not even a frown. Sometimes they call these windows to heaven. The idea is what are the truths, you know, of Christ that we're trying to portray? So how is that art, those pictures of specific saints, specific characters, how is that different than a pretty picture that you would put well, up in a Well, we church? got more history. So we wear our history over, you know, over our heads. Orthodox churches, since they go back, it's a cultural difference. I mean, they're ornate, sometimes too ornate, but the idea is, I mean, people come in here and they're, they're like, oh, you know, they're pretty odd by it. You got the space. And the idea is, you want to, you know, you can't capture, but what you can try to do is create an aura of seeking God. So you have a high space and you have art and you have beauty and color. And again, it's physical too, it's, you know, resurrectional, so it's physical. So it's not just, you know, you want a spiritual thing, so you, you just have writings like Islam, you know, you just put a few words and then that's it. For us, it's like, you know, we're pursuing the physical too. I, I'm, I'm standing in front of God, I'd like to look into his eyes, but you know, so we have an icon of Jesus overhead. But, the, but we went through a period where the, the icons were rejected. That's yeah. a long story I don't want to get into. Way, it. way back in the day, uh, right? Twice it happened, I, 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 iconoclasm we called it. But what happened was uh, the church from the very beginning adapt, adopted art as part of the beauty. And if you see, you know, God is talking to, to, you know, to Moses and you know, he says, you know, build an ark and I want this by, you know, this size. I want golden things, your best artisans. You know, I mean, if God orders up things like this, if, if Solomon can build a be beautiful temple, these are physical places. And so, the, you know, Judaism understood the physicality of a place, a sacred place. And so the church adopts that. And what happened was when we started doing images and the, and the whole concept of images became theologically assaulted, the church finally on the second round came up with a theology and said, look, Jesus is real. We did look into his eyes. We heard him laugh. We heard and saw him. And so it's not wrong to, you know, we don't remember what he looks like. We, we don't, what he looks like. We don't have, we didn't have cameras in those days. But we paint pictures of him to remember because he was real. But I would argue that for a church that didn't have the Bible for 1,500 years until the printing press and literally longer, 
the iconography was the teaching tool of its day. It was the mm -hmm. audiovisual of its day. So, you know, when kids, adults, illiterates, whatever, you know, were in church, they would see the, the stories in the panels, and they knew the stories because they were painted around them. And, and just so I'm not saying, well, you know, we invented this. Like I said, if you go to, you see them in the catacombs. I mean, they were there from the very, from yep. very early. Yep. And, and Christians had no problem with that. I mean, Christians adopted things. Um, what you're looking at is basically 2,000 years of it going a certain way. Like I said, it's very stylized. It's a very narrow form of art, but it's a very unique form of art. And um, it's partly where we've been. In, in view of the resurrection and in view that we're all God's children, there's no separation between the living and the dead. We call the church, you know, that's the people that have died, the church triumphant, or we're the church militant. We're still fighting the good, the good fight. Yeah. But there's still one church, and we're united beyond the ages. We don't forget the dead. I don't understand that in the Protestant world. It's like once you're dead, you're gone, you're, you know, you're out of it. And it's like, why, because you can't donate anymore? All of God's family is, is united, and we remember them in the paintings. Okay, so when people go to church, this I recognize from Protestantism. There are pews, you sit there. This I recognize from Protestantism. It looks like the place where the people who run things are sitting, but we do not have one of those in Protestantism. <laughs> what's, with the, uh, what's with the amazing chair? <laughs> Interesting discovery there. That's the bishop's throne. Literally, it's called a throne. Yeah, it really is a throne, and this is a cathedral which means the church of the, the, the bishop's seat. This goes right back to, to uh, Ignatius, you know, that the church's authority is, is represented uh, in, the, in the office of the bishop, and the throne is just a symbol of it. It's a remnant of, of the Roman um, structure. And then this is uh, uh, not where the leaders are. We're actually back in there. Um, this is where people come up for the sacraments. All the sacraments are done here, and it's elevated a little bit. You know, we're raising our, our game, you know, okay. and so working with God. So all the sacraments God. for you guys would be Eucharist? Marriage, baptism, Eucharist. Okay. Um, confession, we usually do face-to-face, -face, so we don't have like, you know, little, little places that we go. So this space, like, it's obviously set apart. This is something different. What is the difference between out here and through those doors? This goes back to the ancient, you know, we inherited a lot of what we believe and do like incense and altars from uh, Judaism. Okay. The columns are pretty unique to this church. Those are Greek keys. This is four or 5,000 year old Greek art. So are the columns. Mm -hmm. um, the, the church adapted the, the, the Greek. I mean, I went to Alaska and they had Greek, to, you know, Greek Orthodox totem poles. The church always adapts. Mm -hmm. Um, so Greek culture is still sort of built in here. Most, most Orthodox churches will have uh, an icon of Christ, you know, an image of Christ, John the Baptist, the Virgin Mary again presenting the Christ, and then the name of the church. Those are pretty standard now in Orthodox churches. And then okay. the rest are just, you know, people put in whatever they want to put. But those are pretty standard now in Orthodox churches. So who do churches. we have out here on the far ends? Actually, I don't remember them all. I have to get my that paper. That makes me look feel really good. I'm glad you don't remember them. <laughs> There's just so many of them. You know? There are so many Actually, of them. this is Constantine. This is, okay. I think, um, I think it's Demetrius. It could be George. Wait, this is Constantine or this is so here? On the left is Constantine and Helen with the cross. Oh, I see the cross now. Yeah, I would expect to see the, uh, like the Chai and Ro symbol or something with him. So well, what happens on the table in here? Um, in the early church, the whole concept of um, uh, the pagan rituals, which well, there was an altar. I mean, that was like a no-no for Christianity. But eventually, as paganism faded, the, the, the church, like everything else, assimilated and adopted that. So okay. they, sometimes they still call it the table of oblation. And the, but the sacrifice is not a bloody sacrifice, although we do the, the body and blood of Christ. So it is blood, but it's really bread and wine, and we know that. But by God, you know, it's, 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 this is my body, and so we believe that. Okay. We don't use like tr transubstantiation or words like that. We don't try to limit it. We don't know exactly how it it's works. A mystery. But it's mystery. Cool. Yeah. Okay. Our church is very focused on mystery. We, everything in here is mystical. So what we do is we, we prepare everything up there, bring it out and serve it. So there's, you know, the clergy work from here, pass through. And this would be like technically like what, what the, Jude, the Judaism would call the Holy of Holies. Okay. Um, and so, there, so they're the... There's a certain type of priest that can go in at certain times. Is so yeah, for us, nobody, nobody walks here. through the doors except the priest. Uh, some people will say, well, women don't go on the altar, and that we have this thing about women that's not true. There's no limit to it. It's just that whoever, you don't go in there unless you have a reason to be in there. Okay. And only the priests have a reason to be in there. 
You know, something else you might notice is like, you know, we have this uh, behind the altar. The altar's pretty simple, just a couple of candles. Mm -hmm. That little thing on the top is, a, we call it tabernacle. We just keep reserve sacrament in there for emergencies. This gold fella here. Yeah, okay. and then behind it is uh, a crucifix, but you won't see Stations of the Cross or really gory crosses. I mean, there is a little bit of blood on there, but the whole, the, the focus is not on the crucifixion. And that's what really sets us apart. Our view of salvation is different when we sit down, we'll talk about that. There's also a chair back there, I don't know if you can see it. That's called the Synthronon. That's the actual bishop's chair. That's where the bishop actually sits. The one in the front was uh, where the emperor used to sit. And the okay. emperor being coronated, he didn't get communion from the bishop. He'd go up and take communion himself oh. because he, you know, was appointed by God to run the kingdom, which was considered Christian. But, you know, all that's gone. Boy, that's tricky. Oh, yeah. What are we looking at here? Uh, this is a baptismal font. How do you fit somebody in there to dunk them? This is for babies. Well, I'm a, I mean, I could fit in there. Yeah, but we have a really, it's, you couldn't put an adult in there. So do you actually immerse a baby in this? Yeah. Really? Yeah, we believe in full immersion. And um, um, we, we, we don't have an age of reasoning like the Roman Catholics and the, right. the Protestants got that from Roman Catholic, so Catholic Catholicism. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, as a parent, you, you teach your kids from the very beginning. So this is not about indoctrinating our kids and saying, well, you're not old enough to make a decision. This is about from youth allowing them to participate in the sacraments. We don't deny that to children. So, so kids get to. Oh, yeah. And there's no 12 year old stuff. It's just, you know, there's no age of reasoning because that limits. What if you have, you know, get hit in the head and you can't think straight? Great point. You know, yeah. I mean, there's I've always no, wondered about it's that. about this. It's about your heart. So we, we don't have any limitations on kids. Most of our baptisms are kids, but we do get adults. And so, you know, we, you know, the church has been settled in for a couple thousand, you know, 1500 years. So mostly it's babies. So does somebody become a part of the Greek Orthodox Church upon baptism? Yeah, and that's pretty universal in Christianity, so born a, again and all of that. So if a family came in and all kind of converted at once and they have like a, a 10 year old, they wouldn't be able to receive the sacrament until they're, the baptized. until they're baptized. Right. So when you, when you do communion, I'm sorry, the Eucharist. It's okay. Uh, you, <laughs> you call it communion, right? yeah. You do, a, okay, yeah. all right. Um, so like some kind of blessing or something happens up here. Bread and wine. And we bring that Leavened all out. Leavened bread and wine. That's Leavened. Leavened. We so we actually well. use bread. We do too. And it's real wine, not grape juice, it's wine. It's enos in Greek and you know, there's, we don't have the puritanical roots. Do you get in trouble with the government or do they make an exception for uh, kids drinking no, wine I suppose if Jesus used peyote, we'd be there too. <laughs> yeah, that's true. There's an exception for that. Okay. All right. So this, so this comes out, do people just line up down the middle or do you distribute it out into and the every room? Every church is a little different. Uh, this church, you know, there's, this is pretty big. And so we usually have three, if not four lines. So it's usually a guy there, I'm in the middle, and another guy there, and we usually have three lines. All right, so I'm on my way upstairs here, and I feel a little less formal when I get back here to the back of the room, because this place really does make me feel something. And if you've watched any of my other stuff, you know that churches have this effect on me, even if I don't think all of the exact same stuff, because there's beauty in how artfully this communicates truth. And, and spiritual truth as they understand spiritual truth. But also, this space is designed to make you feel things about God and yourself and where you fit. And one of the big differences I noticed between this and the really amazing Catholic churches I've been to is that Catholic churches are made to make you feel small, but to communicate the authority of the church. Whereas this is more like the concept of the round table. It's like it's designed to make you feel like you're a part of the church, like you're a part of this almost uh, Romans concept of a, a cloud of witnesses that you're surrounded by who are alive and with you and even participating in your faith as you participate in your moment on the stage of history. It's a subtle difference, but I think that difference is intentional. And I think it's evolved that way over the years between Catholic churches and Orthodox churches because of theology. Chris, I, what title am I supposed to use? Is it pastor? Is it reverend? No, people usually say Father Chris. It's uh, <clears throat> St. Paul says, I fathered you in the faith. Okay. And the Father is not a, a, a title. Jesus is called no man Father. It's a recognition of the Holy Spirit. So the rank doesn't come from anything that we do or earn. It's, it's recognition of the Holy Spirit. Do you like Father or do you like Chris? Uh, um, I don't care. Okay, I'll go with Chris for now then. <laughs> Take me back to the beginning. When did 
When did the Eastern Orthodox Church or the Orthodox Church start? Pentecost. That's Acts how we view it. Yeah, and the thing about it is like, you know, okay, in the Catholic Church, it's like, you know, Peter was given the keys of the kingdom of heaven. But Matthew 16. The, but <laughs> was Peter or the apostles? And, you know, our viewpoint is to all the apostles. And, and what did Jesus say? The gates of hell will not prevail against the church. Well, if that's true, you can't have the church existing, apostating, and then re-existing. There has to be a continuity, otherwise J Jesus lied. If there's a promise of continuity, then it should be there. And the, uh, history is very important to Christianity, otherwise you're reinventing it. Christ never wrote a single word. <clears throat> he trusted us to pass it on. I think the reason he never wrote anything is because he didn't trust us to keep it. <laughs> you're not putting those words in my mouth. That's what we do. Uh, what he basically taught people, and then they passed it on. And yeah. so people say that, well, this is where I get in trouble a lot. This people is, you know, this, the scripture is the source. No, it's not. It's the events that are the source. The people who lived it. Scripture didn't get written until, you know, after, you know, literally almost 100 years later. And we didn't have printing presses until Gutenberg, which was a contemporary of Martin Luther. So for three quarters of the church life till the 1500s, we didn't have Bibles. We didn't have Bibles. And in our church, we didn't have them until the 1800s because we were enslaved. So um, how did the church get by without Bibles? You know, the history of it's important. That's why the, the iconography in the dome is relevant. That's the audiovisual of the ancient world. That's how they taught things. If, if there's no history and no continuity, then the Holy Spirit's got problems. And the Holy Spirit doesn't have problems. We're the ones with problems. Our interpretations are the ones with problems. And uh, argument with Protestantism is like, uh, you know what I said earlier, if you got it on tape, I don't know, but you know, you've got a pope and you don't like it. So your response is to make everybody a pope. Everybody mm -hmm. believes whatever they want to believe. And that doesn't work either. If, if the Holy Spirit's speaking and saying, well, here's the truth, and tells everybody a different truth, that's not working. So, so what's the Orthodox response? Where does theology come from the, in the Orthodox Church? Um, if you look at the, uh, the councils, like the First Council and, and, and the Nicene Council, it's like everybody got together and forged out as best they could. You know, in other words, you, you hammered it out through consensus, which is pretty much what science does. You know, it belongs to everybody. You can't take it too far because everybody won't go too far. Hmm. But then when it goes places you don't want to go, you can fix it. So would you say the Roman Catholic Church started in Acts chapter 2 as well? No. No, I wouldn't. So you, so you would say that the Greek, the Orthodox <laughs> Church Look, the is Catholic the Catholic church. church um, has gone through a lot of changes. I mean, you know, when, you, when, you, when a pope can speak ex cathedra, and he, he tried to force himself over the whole church. It's basically a resurgence of, of the Roman Empire. Um, they have a history and a continuity, and I think we recognize mm -hmm. that. Orthodoxy recognizes that. But we don't consider them heretics as, well, we actually do. I think we consider them more schismatics because we're trying to work it out. We've got a thousand-year problem. Right. And they've divided Christianity, and then they, that's what gave birth to the, the Reformation. And it's like, how do you put all this back together again? So... So I feel like I am super crystal clear on the Protestant read on Scripture in terms of how salvation happens, but I have to admit, I have no idea how you guys think of it. So can you like explain to me like I'm five, how does a person, how is a person a Christian in the Orthodox I Church? I would say that the Protestant and the Catholic world, which you got it from them, sorry. Okay, no, 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 it's all right. Is what I would call based on redemptive theology. Okay. All right, so redemptive theology works like this. Um, Man is sinful. God sure. rejected. Uh, uh, we re rejected God, and therefore we're punished, and we receive God's justice because we rejected God. And God's punishment is just, and 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 the wages of sin is death. So we're paying, but God doesn't want that. So He offers some salvation. So He offers Jesus to pay the price, yes. and so Jesus pays the price of blood, and then we are redeemed. Therefore, redemptive theology, washed by the blood of the Lamb and set free. Yes. Okay. That's salvation. But is it? That's, that's actually a formula. And that's all it is. So let me go back and explain that. So our salvation works like this. <clears throat> we, we rejected God, and God is life. We chose death. We, by rejecting God, we rejected life. <clears throat> and God is not so punishing as to say, oh, I have to have a price of blood. You know, is God really that narrow? You know? He doesn't, we've chosen that out of the freedom that he gave us. He gave us enough freedom to reject him, and we did. So he basically becomes human, 
and, and tries to reclaim us, but not with taking our freedom away. He comes and says, this is the, uh, the path of salvation. So first he becomes human, he incarnates, becomes human, teaches us, leads us, and then he accepts death. And it's not the death that saved us. And this whole thing about in Isaiah that uh, by his stripes are we healed? Mm -hmm. You know, does that mean that by whipping him and making him suffer that God somehow his justice was justified? Or does it mean that because he did that we found a path? Because now will I lead all men to myself. People don't pay attention to boring stories. Uh, um, the, the, the pearl of English literature is, is, is um, uh, Romeo and Juliet. If they didn't die in that awkward manner, it would be a boring story, right? If Jesus didn't die a horrific death, who would have paid attention? Now will I draw all men to myself. Salvation didn't occur on the cross. It occurred on the third day. And Jesus didn't raise from the dead. And this is where I think Protestants get it wrong. Jesus raised from the dead to prove that he was the redeemer. He rose from the dead to prove that he was God and only that God could redeem. No. Jesus raised from the dead because he was human. Because that's the plan for humans. That's salvation. We're going to raise from our graves. And if you read the Nicene Creed, it's really clear. I believe in the resurrection of the dead and the life of the age to come. Amen. So you believe in, in the punishment of God. You believe in the grace, the mercy, the resurrection no, of God. Punishment, pause there. Yeah. I would argue and say, see, if you read it in and say, well, God is angry and he's punishing. I don't see God as angry and he's punishing. I see God is consistent. God is consistent. So if he says, I gave you freedom and I will not take it away. And you use the freedom to destroy yourself. He's not punishing you. You chose it. So and what happens if you choose no? We believe in hell. Look, hell is, hell is not some place that God prepared to get you away from Him. Hell is God. God is the fire of hell. If you reject God, you're, you're facing the full force of his, of his power without Him. I don't know how that would work. I don't know what, really what hell is. Uh, all I know is um, it's probably the only thing in life I really fear. Hmm. I, I don't fear judgment, but I do fear God. And I, I know if you reject Him, I think hell is not a big party of wild people who just say, hey, we're not a party, dude. I think it's a bunch of lonely people who hate, every, hate everything except themselves. And it will not be a pleasant place. But God won't let them die either. He won't just say, well, we're going to erase you to oblivion. He doesn't do that. You know, we don't have venial or mortal sins. Okay. Yeah, we, we don't do that either. I think in the resurrection changes the perspective, right? So... So here we are at judgment. We're resurrected in a judgment. And on your right hand is the guy that murdered you. And on your left is the guy that slandered you. So in a break there, you turn to the guy on the right and you go, so what? You didn't accomplish anything. Here I am. <laughs> you know? <laughs> <laughs> and you turn to the guy on your left and you go, but I'll never forget what you said. <laughs> in the light of the resurrection, when all life is restored, you know, which sins are worse? <laughs> I mean, think about it. There's a, there's a great equalizer to all of this stuff. And it helps, I think, forge how you're going to be as a Christian. Don't slander people. Don't do bad things. Certainly don't kill people. But that doesn't have the permanence of some of the other things. It's all in the, 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 the resurrection puts a balance on things that wasn't there, including the great love of God and the great gift of life and how precious it is, precious it is even to him. Closing thoughts here. I looked up this guy, Pastor Chris, out of the blue. I was like, hey, uh, here's all I'm really asking of you. I would just like for you to trust me, someone you've never met, to come to your church somewhere I've never been. And then I would like you to just host me for three or four hours, show me all around, take a whole bunch of your time, sit with me for an interview, trust that I'll represent you fairly when I edit that up and film it and send it out to the whole internet for them to see. Oh, and also I'd like you to just be ridiculously honest about everything because I genuinely want to understand a faith tradition well, your faith tradition better. And dude was like, yeah, okay, cool. When do you want to come? <laughs> it's awesome. So look, make sure to extend thanks and appreciation to Pastor Chris for being willing to turn over his cards, even if you don't agree with or like all of those cards. The goal of a, a conversation like this is not to go in guns a-blazing to try to convince the other guy that all the things that I think and have figured out are right because I'm so smart and a Bible genius. I'm not. No, the goal of a conversation like this, and I hope the goal of watching a video like this for you is just learn, understand a different expression of belief, a little different flavor of Christianity, and frankly, a really significant, important one better. That's the effect it had on me. I made a friend. I learned a whole bunch of stuff. 
I feel like I better understand the points of commonality that we share. And I feel like I better understand and I'm not threatened by the places where I just see it different. Whatever the case, I love Pastor Chris. I'm so grateful for you for having an appetite for this kind of conversation. And thanks a ton for just being around this channel in general. You're awesome. I'm Matt. This is a 10-minute Bible hour. I always say this at the end. I don't know why I do that. Thanks. I'll see you soon.